<clears throat> I think immediately I felt like killing myself. Bob Blackford thought that death was his only way out. If I drove my car off the mountains behind us here, um, no one would know. Bob has been HIV positive for 28 years, making him one of the longest living HIV survivors. I don't know anyone else who's had it as long as me. 30 years has passed since the Center for Disease Control recognized what we now know as HIV. Dr. Robert Gallo was one of the early researchers on the trail of this virus. At the beginning, I mean, it was just horrifying. I mean, I, everybody eventually had friends with AIDS. Nobody died well of AIDS in 1985. It just looked, uh, they, were, they began to be emaciated like, a, like a final stage cancer patients. The people I was seeing with AIDS had such devastating disease, such immune destruction. Why some lived and some died, there's no explanation. We couldn't do anything about it. I saw the horror of this disease. I don't think there's any disease you could suffer more with. In the mid-1980s, confusion surrounded this killer that appeared to reside in the gay community. Everyone had ideas, but many were wrong. Ideas like HIV really doesn't exist, AIDS doesn't exist, it's nutrition or things like that. Or HIV exists but doesn't cause AIDS. It does, you know, what causes AIDS? Well, everything, bad nutrition, drug addicts, you know, the gays are taking all kinds of drugs, that was it. These were ideas really promoted. I don't want to get into the people, but, um, you know, it was really awful. So there was a huge amount of fear involved with it at that time, not knowing. Um, fear not only of getting it, but of anybody who might have it. And no one knew anyone who had it. We just knew people in San Francisco and L.A. and New York had this horrible disease that just wiped out their immune system and, and uh, killed them. And there was just a lot of ignorance. And it, of course, what it does is it makes me feel, made me feel like I had leprosy. In the early 80s, the scientific community was on the verge of a pivotal discovery. In 1983, our group and a group in France made some substantial strides. And by the end of 83 to early 1984, my colleagues and myself made some dramatic advances that led us to say, this is the cause of AIDS and we have a blood test and we're there. Gallo and the scientists in France would be credited as co-discoverers of AIDS by the U.S. government. I remember when they developed the antibody test in 1985, um, hearing that they were going to inform people uh, through the mail and thinking, what a horrible way to find out that you were going to die. We knew this was a scientific as well as medical, social, emergency. I was informed through the blood bank. I got a letter uh, saying that uh, your, your last blood supply was um, uh, abnormal. And when I found out, um, it was um, a death sentence. I just began to emotionally and mentally prepare to die, um, knowing that or believing at the time that every, every birthday of my children or every event, every 4th of July, every Christmas, everything would be my last one. Well, my two daughters were 9 and 12 at the time. Clearly knew that I would not see them grow up, uh, go to school, get married, have children. This disease, whose origins are traced back to primates in Africa, showed up first in gay communities in heavily populated cities worldwide. Soon, it began to spread. What was rare and remote in a rainforest had by now become rather common and global. Dennis Wadley has witnessed the devastating effects of HIV and AIDS firsthand while doing community development work in Sub-Saharan Africa. Two-thirds of the worldwide cases of HIV are in Sub-Saharan Africa. The infection rate in the United States would be about one in 350. In South Africa, it's going to be one in nine. Worldwide, HIV and AIDS has claimed over 25 million lives, more than the number of soldiers killed during World War II. I did finally get sick in 1992 and realized that I wasn't going to escape this and had a very low immune system, and I began the dying process. In the early 90s, 
There was no highly effective drugs to treat HIV and AIDS. The only options available had terrible side effects and killed many of those already sick. Well, this is, this is where sort of the mystery comes in. I spent the last 40 years of my adult life in a, in a Christian church environment, and uh, my pastor was the first person that I told about this. The first time I got really sick with a pneumonia and, and was about ready to be hospitalized, he brought people over here to our house, and uh, they prayed for me, and it's one of those mysterious things I can't explain, but my fever went away. Uh, immediately and never came back and I, I had no trace of the pneumonia from there on. I think having hope and believing that I might actually beat this thing was the biggest part for me. Once someone gives up and their body gives up. We also knew we better get a vaccine. We knew it would be difficult. We didn't dream it would be this difficult. With the existing drug therapy regimens, Bob is able to live his life and enjoy the simple everyday moments. Look at Lil, here's a big one. Mondays consist of getting to help babysit our little three-year-old granddaughter. Is that it for strawberries? Bob never expected to see his daughters married, let alone to see his grandchildren grow up. You know what? I'm seeing way too much sandwich there. I think we need to eat the sandwich first. I get to play with them. I get to read to them. Here. I get to watch them grow up. I get to go to their birthday parties. I don't understand why. I didn't die in the first or second wave of this. Occasionally, we find some people infected right at the beginning. Well, I've had HIV almost 29 years. The percent that are still alive, I would guess is less than 1%. You sure you want to eat all those? Yeah, Bob finds comfort Hi. and offers it to others in a support group for people who have been HIV positive for more than 10 years. Our doctor originally got us together because he thought that um, we should know each other. I'm sure there'd be some kind of explanation for that. It's a place where we're, we just get to be. Um, like any support group in that sense, I don't have to explain. It's a different world today. It's not perfect. People still have problems that are HIV infected, but they can live a reasonable life and without the horror previously known. I think the similarity all around the world with HIV is that it's, it's a disease that is filled with stigma. Understand that it's not the stigma that it used to be. In my culture, in my neighborhoods that I grew up with in down in Los Angeles, they still see it as, you know, a, a dirty little secret. The Santa Barbara HIV and AIDS Food Pantry is a safe haven for those in need. And you know, it's a good place for everyone to come and talk to each other. You know, sometimes this is the only time they'll talk about their HIV status, is here for that hour, and then never again. But many people still aren't talking because they don't know their HIV status, according to a USA Today analysis of data from Emory University's AIDS View project. The study also reveals that over 200,000 Americans with HIV are getting diagnosed so late in the course of their illness that they are dramatically shortening their lives and spreading HIV. It is not just a homosexual disease, it's a heterosexual disease. I think there's a greater chance now to not live in shame, to not be stigmatized. Okay, I'll get you, I'll get you. What I'd like people to know is that we don't ever get over having HIV. I got you! And I want them to know that we're people, that there's n nothing different about us. <laughs> In the United States, I believe it's important that we don't allow this to slip off the grid. At this point, there's no cure for it. There's no way to get rid of it. We need to do better. We need to get a cure. We need to get a preventive vaccine. I have thought about how I want to be remembered or what my legacy might be. Sometimes I think too much about it. I'd like people to think of me as caring and compassionate and somehow other-centered and that it didn't, I didn't allow HIV and AIDS to define me and limit me and identify me.